freedom is not allowing people to do things that you approve of. Freedom is about protecting people's right to do things you find distasteful. And on the subject of finding things distasteful, let me introduce Dave Kopel, <laughs> who is our research director at the Independence Institute, our Second Amendment expert, researcher extraordinaire, and we couldn't do what we do without him. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Dave Kopel. Thank you. What I'd like to talk about today is two themes that come together. One is what's wrong with Michael Bloomberg, and the second is what's wrong with John Caldera. And I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up and then we'll see how it fits. Now, Michael Bloomberg is the, among other things, the head of this faux uh, ad, grassroots, supposedly, organization called Mayors Against Illegal Guns, which is by finances by far the economic center of the gun prohibition movement in this country today. Very wealthy, lots and lots of lobbyists uh, in D.C. and in state capitals around the country. George Soros put some money into it as well. They've, they've got some bucks. But it's not exactly what it seems. They have 12 people who got their names off this list of supposedly mayors illegal, against illegal guns when they said, I never signed up for this, you just put my name on it without asking me, or you told me it was this group that was against illegal guns, and you know, there's really not too many people for illegal guns, so I, I, I signed up, I said it was okay, but it turns out you're just against guns in general. In fact, there's also 19 people, 19 mayors, members of Mayors Against Illegal Guns, who now have left office because of felony convictions, or because they're indict under indictment, or because charges are pending, or because they had to resign and maybe the prosecutor was nice and didn't bring the case. And you figure that those 19 criminals in Mayors Against Illegal Guns mean that this organ Michael Bloomberg's organization has a much higher crime rate than do people ha who have permits to carry handguns for lawful protection. I think in the interest of, of truth in advertising that the, the proper way to refer to this group is illegal mayors against guns. <laughs> but I, I would say, on, on the other hand, they have done one important service. One, there's a lot of people who wonder, well, is there an afterlife or not, and how, how could you ever know for sure? Well, one mayor who was in this group and genuinely signed up for it passed away. And yet, afterwards, Mayors Against Illegal Guns was distributing letters lobbying on the gun issue, anti-gun issue, signed by this now deceased <laughs> mayor. So if there's any doubt, well, I mean, doesn't that prove there's an afterlife? Now, I'm not sure if, if writing anti-gun letters is the most ideal way to, to spend it, but, you know, probably, pro probably this mayor enjoyed it. <laughs> what we see out of, out of Michael Bloomberg and his crowd consistently, and including in the, their attempts to exploit the recent murders in Aurora, and in Wisconsin, and, and really every day, is this undifferentiated hostility towards gun ownership and people who own, especially to people who own firearms for protection. Now we know this is rather hypocritical, because when Michael Bloomberg says people shouldn't have guns for protection, I guess he has his fingers crossed with his mental reservation, but on the other hand, if you can get an entire New York City police security detail carrying machine guns to accompany you every second, that's okay, because after all, he isn't personally owning a gun for protection, so maybe he feels uh, there's some kind of difference there. And they put out these terrible, malicious libels against people, like when they say the only reason that a person would own an AR-15 rifle is because they want to be a mass murderer. What a horrible thing to say about the, literally the millions of Americans who have made the AR-15 today the most popular, best-selling rifle in the United States of America, and what a malicious falsehood to say about our police who frequently carry an AR-15 in their squad cars in those circumstances where they might need a rifle for backup. Neither the Americans, regular civilians, who use AR-15s for target shooting, for home defense, for hunting uh, game up to the size of deer, it's not powerful enough for something larger than that, 
nor do the police have that, those firearms, those AR-15s among others, because they want to harm a lot of people. They have those firearms for legitimate purposes, and especially of protecting themselves and other people. What we do at the Independence Institute in our legal work on the gun issue and the briefs we file is almost always we file joint amicus briefs with police organizations. We, with a huge coalition of police organizations and the Supreme Court amicus briefs we filed in Heller and McDonald. Uh, just last week in Woolard versus uh, Gallagher in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, our amicus brief was filed not only for the Independence Institute, but for the two major organizations which train law enforcement in firearms use. These are the policemen who are the firearms trainers for all the rest of the police, the International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association and the International Association of Law Enforcement Firearms Instructors. And what we consistently say with the police is there's one key principle which has two manifestations, and one is guns in the wrong hands are very dangerous, and we need strong laws to try to keep guns out of the right hands, and when they get into the wrong hands to punish mis misuse and put somebody away so they can't uh, endanger somebody. And at the same time, guns in the right hands protect public safety. They help the police protect people, they help civilians protect each other, they sometimes help civilians protect the police. So we also need strong laws to make sure that there are guns in the right hands to protect, to protect the rights of law-abiding citizens to purchase, own, use, and carry firearms. Forty years ago, there were virtually no gun laws, almost in, in Colorado or most of the United States, of any sort. And the reason that the gun debate in this country has finally settled down after four decades, as it has in Colorado, and especially after all that we went through after Columbine, is we've come to a Colorado consensus and a national consensus based on common sense, and we have added a lot of laws to strengthen trying to keep guns out of the wrong hands, and we've added a lot more laws to protect the rights of law-abiding people. The most important of these laws in Colorado, which is the same thing we're fighting for in the, in the Willard case in Maryland, Maryland being one of nine holdout states on this issue so far, is the right to carry. The Colorado's right to carry law was written by the county sheriffs of Colorado. It ensures that a law-abiding adult who passes a fingerprint-based background check and a safety training class can obtain a permit to carry a handgun for lawful protection. That's our single most important post-Columbine reform. Thank you. At the Independence Institute, we worked on this issue for nearly, a, for over a decade to make it become a law. And what a difference it's already made. You know what happened in December 2007 when an evildoer went into the sanctuary of the New Life Mega Church in Colorado Springs. 7,000 people there. He'd already murdered four people, two in, two in Denver and then two people in the parking lot, and he came in there intent on mass murder. And because of the county sheriffs of Colorado, because of our right to carry law, Genius Assam, a church volunteer, was lawfully carrying a handgun in, in that church to as a church volunteer to protect it. She stopped the killer, Pastor Boyd, said she saved over a hundred lives that day. We are going to... We want laws like that everywhere in the country. We have them in 48 states. Maryland's coming, Maryland's coming soon, and we, it, it's essential that, these, that these, the protection of the right to bear arms be protected national, as, as all national civil rights should be. One of the things we're going to be promoting very much at the Independence Institute is stronger laws on mental health. There's lots of ways government spending can be cut, uh, starting with corporate welfare, which is illegal and by four different clauses of our Colorado Constitution. Uh, so we shouldn't be doing it legally anyway, but we ought to cut that out. And one of the things that we want to really promote this from here on in uh, including the next session of the legislature, is better funding for mental health services because not only sensational crimes like in Aurora, but a lot of the homicides that happen that never get camera crews from other continents out here and around the country are committed by people who are seriously mentally ill, who 30 years ago or 50 years ago would have properly been institutionalized, and there are no beds for them now and no support system. We want to change that. We want to take money out of the hands of corporate, uh, take money away from corporate welfare, 
of the special interest and put it into the community interest of a better, strong system of mental health in Colorado. Yay. Let me quickly talk about what's wrong. So we know what's wrong with Michael Bloomberg on this issue, but let me tell, tell you what's wrong with John Caldera. <laughs> he was talking about... Oh, well, the mental health stuff? <laughs> well, we, you weren't supposed to talk about that part. <laughs> to talk, when he referred to our alcohol, tobacco, and firearms day as the perks of adulthood, and that's fine to, to characterize alcohol and tobacco in those terms, but it's not right on the firearms side. Let me tell you about two different places in the world. One's Western Australia. There was a study done of Aborigines in Western Australia who were in prison. They, the Ab Aborigines were been convicted of crimes. One group of Ab Aborigines and of these criminals had both groups had acts. Both of the criminals, when they were out, had guns. One group of the imprisoned criminals had misused guns in a crime. The second group, and these were people in prison for committing felonies, and they had guns, but they had never misused a gun against a human being. And what was the difference between the two? It's the ones who had never misused a gun against a person had been taught about guns by an older authority figure such as a father or an uncle. They'd learned about shooting sports, and they'd acquired an attitude of treating guns with responsibility and saw them as something you use to, to shoot some game and not something you use to try to harm an innocent person. Another study in Rochester, New York, whole other side of the world, they did a, a longitudinal study, meaning o over time, and tried to find the 16-year-olds who were most likely to become the juvenile delinquents and, and criminals, which means they, they didn't study girls at all. I mean, if you want to, <laughs> seriously, I mean, if you, if you want to study crime uh, and you only got so many people you can study, you, you focus on the males. That's just a sociological fact. They tracked them over the years. The youth who at 16 illegally owned a gun. You know, maybe they bought a handgun from, from somebody on the street had, in the future years, a very high rate of being arrested for serious crimes, including gun crimes. The youth who at 16 legally owned a gun, say they had a, a shotgun that their parents had given them and they went hunting with their dad or were rifle shooting uh, with their uncle, they had essentially no crime rate of any type. So the how young people are socialized about guns is hugely important in future outcomes. Now, contrary to this positive socialization that some of the young people in, in Western Australia and in Rochester had, is the tremendously negative socialization that comes through too much of our media, particularly television entertainment and the movies. Now, the people who produce these horrible, grotesque, pornographic celebrations of violence, the Quentin Tarantino movies and those kinds of things, will tell you, oh, that doesn't affect people, it has no influence on, on people, and I'm sure that's true for the large majority of folks. But if you say, oh, really, movies and television and what you see has no effect on, on what people ever do, well, isn't it kind of odd that, that they sell advertising? Boy, what a waste of money that must be, because apparently it's something you watch never has any effect. And how strange it is that these movies and TV shows have sold product placements where they say, oh, if we put a uh, Coca-Cola pays us some money, we'll have a character drink a Coca-Cola. Uh, but apparently, on the other hand, what people see on TV on TV and the movies never has any effect on them. And likewise, the reason that now with the uh, culture war against smoking is you're not supposed to show characters smoking in a movie that the young people are going to see but on the other hand, so that scene does seem like what people see does have an effect. So it's a, so now Hollywood will say, well, we're going to make sure that when a 15-year-old goes to a movie, he's never going to see somebody lighting up a cigarette, but he is going to see this mass violence and gun misuse. And I don't think it's accurate to say that that never has an effect on anyone. So we're not for censorship at the Independence Institute, but we are for counter-programming. And that's part of what ATF Day is about, is about introducing some of you to the shooting sports, getting the others of you the opportunity to, to participate more often, and hoping that all of you go out and 
spread that concentric circle of introducing your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, and especially some young people you know to the responsible shooting sports, which as you know is a culture of safety, of responsibility, of self-control, self-discipline, and really so many things that, that exemplify exactly what's right about America. One of the things we're handing out is from our friends at the NRA, since 1871, America's oldest civil rights organization, and in one of America's oldest mass education organizations as well. They've been teaching people about shooting safety and responsibility with a special focus on young people ever since 1871. So there's lots of materials that you can take, and we encourage you to do that, which will help you do that. One of those I especially recommend is the NRA Qualification Program. It's a, about the size of a magazine, and it, it, it shows you how you can, on your own, whether you like air guns or sporting clays or 22 caliber rifles or revolvers or whatever, courses of target shooting you can go through and earn yourself these cool little patches and medals as you work your way up in proficiency. It's a self-paced thing. Everybody can do it, and we'd encourage you to do it yourself and hope that as many people as possible, you, you bring in as many people as possible. And so on this issue, we are not only on the pro-choice side, we are on the pro-life side as well. And what we're doing at ATF Day and what we do every day at the Independence Institute is to fight for those life-saving values of safety, of responsibility, American constitutional rights. And we're not just protecting those rights in Colorado. In the long term, we are making sure that those rights are protected nationally, as we did in the McDonald case. Uh, on the Second Amendment right to arms. And we look forward to the day when even the people in the most oppressed parts of the United States, under the sweltering heel of Michael Bloomberg, will <laughs> regain their rights to smoke a cigarette or a, or a cigar, to drink a big gulp of soda, and to own and carry a handgun for lawful protection in New York because it is a civil right of every American. Thank you. Yeah.